it, it's a fascinating time. By the way, we're not going to see this again for a decade. That we agree on. That we More. agree on, yeah. This is a blip. It is a triple whammy between rent laws changing, COVID, and interest rates doubling. This is I the, have been writing the great this storm. is going to happen for the last three years. Because the whole industry is going to see a uh, significant uh, fall in the fall. And, you know, uh, we are going to see a disaster in commercial real estate uh, for many, many reasons. Um, you know, you've got a third of all commercial debt coming due in the next two years. They're certainly not going to get refined at the same rates. Most of this commercial debt is out there on some sort of a floating basis that's been fixed through derivatives, right? You can't buy indexes anymore. You can't buy swaps because it's too expensive. You know, the, the rates have killed it. And so that's the easy part, right? Those are the things that put disaster into real estate in the past. Now we have the extra burden of, well, really two things. One, there's no more office space, right? No one's coming back. The number that I read in the press in New York is 22 to 27 percent vacancy, but that doesn't account for what is more than 25 percent of the space that's in sublease mode and isn't getting relet at the end of those leases. So we've got a 50 plus percent vacancy rate in urban office, and then if you go to a sanctuary city, uh, it's getting more and more like that here too. You know, look at San Francisco, you've got the homelessness crisis, you've got, uh, that urban center is not coming back for decades if it comes back at all. And so we're going to see a massive negative externality in commercial real estate with maybe one really bright area in that sort of last mile distribution, maybe some industrial as we pick up uh, our decoupling from China. Uh, but I, you know, I would be petrified if I owned major office buildings today. Listen, I think, you know, what you're saying is fascinating. And I think the first thing is the humanity of it. Most people, right, you're talking about strictly a very professional class, right? Let's call that the head of the comet, right? The Brookfields and the related. They know it. They've seen it. They can talk about it. You read the front page of the paper. We're handing back the keys, you know? But here in these major cities, there's so many players that are mid-market, still billionaires on 30,000 units, 15,000 units, you know, but still have never been in this situation. So first and foremost, they think that there's some magic bullet that comes out of nowhere in order to save them. So first is a psychology That's perspective, me. right? <laughs> yeah, the the savior here sitting at the yeah, table. the fucking broker over here. That's right, that's right. <laughs> but like the, that, there's a psychology, right? You don't want to sit there and say, oh my God, I just created a business plan, whether it was a fund or a human, I put my cash into a cash money, common equity. I go, I have a business plan to execute. When I got to the end of that business plan, halfway through Corona hit, I then survived Corona. I'm now dealing with interest rates. The last thing you're thinking is, you know what? If you were really honest with yourself, you're so fucked and you should be mitigating your downside risk. And what does that actually mean? You may have to be coming after the guarantees. We don't know just yet. Well, so that's that's a great point, right? So what is a downside risk? But it's very different. If you're Brookfield, downside risk is some negative PR as you hand the keys back to a $487 million loan on, on the major mall in San Francisco, right? To another billionaire who gave you the loan. Right. right? <laughs> and, so, yeah, and, a... and so nobody's crying for you. And then four days later, Brookfield buys an insurance company, right? But that's not the reality for the typical billionaire. And it's certainly not the reality for the typical millionaire. We call that the long tail. Right? The long so, tail. So, so most of the debt is going to be non-recourse, right, uh, at that level. But there are plenty of guys, even the guys who say they don't PG stuff. Let's unpack that for a second because I think it's important. I'm not sure everyone is as savvy as the four of us in this room in understanding these terms. Non-recourse, meaning you're not responsible for the principal on that debt. 
but there's all types of carve out guarantees Springing when you're talking guarantees. about Springing large guarantees. developments. You're talking about large assets that are huge numbers. So yeah, the loan is a hundred million. You're not on recourse for that, but they got you on a carry guarantee, which is the interest, the taxes, and the insurance to carry that. That could be hundreds of thousands, if not millions, a month. So even we say non recourse, and people's assumption is you just pass back keys. There's a huge burden on you. Well, but that that. Uh, so yes, but there are different types of carve-out guarantees, right? Um, and unless you're a crook, you shouldn't worry about them because whether uh, if it's an environmental guarantee, then it doesn't change with the economy doesn't and what matter. happens. So it nope. either is or isn't a bad deal, and most of it is nothing, and many guys insure against that today. But, but the only other really carve-outs are bad boy guarantees. And so sometimes they are, if you fail to pay some of those things, um, most of the time it's if you commit waste or you steal or you've lied or you've done, you know, uh, uh, misappropriation of funds. You know what's great about this country? As long as you follow the rules and as long as you don't commingle or, you know, do what's typically referred to as you are alter ego using the funds of one to pay for the expenses of another, Unless you provide a voluntary guarantee, you will never subject one entity to liability of another. Yeah, but I disagree with that, yeah, uh, Jacob, because <laughs> we're not we're not here to talk about the related. We're not here to talk about the big boys because they can handle all that. No, talk about the about, guys that do it wrong. I'm talking about the <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, let me let me let me qualify that a little bit. You talk about the guys that do it wrong. The guys that are doing it quote unquote wrong, they actually want to do it right. But what they do is they extend themselves, okay? And when they extend themselves, they think that it's okay, wink, wink, I'll figure it out, I'll pay Peter to pay Paul. And when those springing guarantees talk about committing waste and they talk about committing fraud, you know, I don't want to talk about any of the people that I represent, but what I'm going to say is that that is going to see the market in a way that is going to change the landscape of, of the real estate industry because there's about four or five, six developers that I can see on my on my hands right now that have some very, very serious issues with criminal law, money laundering, sure. tax evasion. But respectfully, that's not doing it right. Okay, That's exactly doing it wrong. Now, you know what? Uh, I got to tell you guys, I think that that is a false narrative. We are talking as if you and I are 30,000 square feet up if you're someone who says, okay, I made capital, I'm going to invest it into real estate, I want to get commercial debt, that lender sends you a document that's 500 pages long, all about the things that you're responsible for, how you have to act, uh, what you have what's to your do. personal financial statement in order to give us credit enhancement on this deal. When you're huge, fine, they go, you're a credible party. But if you're trying to break into real estate, which is everyone else that then develops 15 townhomes in the BX or doing the 20, 20 units in, you know, uh, Washington Heights. It doesn't yeah. matter. If you want to get commercial debt they, and you, have, you don't have this credibility and you have a balance sheet, they're going to take as much as they can. And at that time, you don't have a million people willing to give you money. Right. You have four banks. Those four banks ask for the same thing. And guess what? You have no choice. It's a catch-22. To me, what's most fascinating about this conversation is who is here right now? You should be listening. I don't think there's a better room to be listening to a podcast on distressed assets and what is happening to the marketplace in, I can only say New York. I don't know if you're a national or not, but like, you know, what you're doing, like, we all want to know. What you're doing, we all want to know. Like, how you view it, we want to know. So, so I'd love like a quick first? intro. Just to hear, like, yeah, sure. why we're here. Counterpoint, and then we're going to go. Okay, okay, All fine, right, fine, fine. Go. So the, my, my point was, is that if they had hired competent counsel, restructuring counsel, because there's a problem with counsel sometimes. You hire a commercial litigator, he takes on something that should be restructured. You hire a restructuringist, it should be a complex litigation. But if they had competent, good counsel, when that was happening, when the lender reached out to them and said, Hey, you owe me money. Hey, we got to refinance. You got to give me that that lease. If you had competent counsel, that competent counsel would have said, you can't do that. You have a contract. You have a contract in the LLC. File for bankruptcy. Get 90 more days. Hold on. Get 90 more days. 
You're, you're one month out. You're month, one month out to getting that signature on that tenant, right? Great. File for bankruptcy. And when I told that to one of my clients, he's like, I could have done that? I was like, yeah, you could have done that. Because you, you have an ass in the LLC, you need financing. You can't get it in time. You need three more months, you need two more months. You should have filed for bankruptcy. It's not bad faith, arguably not bad faith. You sign it when they move to, uh, move to lift stay. You sign that lease and you say, hey, now you got to get me that financing. What did you want to say? Uh, I, I, I respectfully disagree. Good. Well, we want to hear it. We want to agree with you. Respectfully disagreeing, I agree with you, and I'll tell you why. And that's we're, because we're, you guys are coming from it as bankruptcy lawyers. No, he's not no, a bankruptcy I'm not, attorney. I'm not an attorney. Okay. Ergo, ergo, introduce yourself. Okay, introduce so yourself. We are the first line of defense right now. We used to be the last guys to the party. We used to get a phone call from an attorney. We work with all the top bankruptcy attorneys. In you the city. provide dip financing. Is that what you do? No, no, no. No, no. he's about to so, say it. Calm oh, down. Right. You're so, on your first day. Relax. So. It used to be that we would get the phone call on the back end and the attorney would say, I'd like you to meet this borrower. You know, he's interviewing brokers or I told him you're the best. He's about to hire you. And we would come in and we would sell the asset. So they'd say we're filing a, a chapter 11 plan of reorganization or we'd be brought in by a trustee. They'd say we're doing a 363 liquidation, whatever it would be. We were the last guys in. It was sell the asset. That was our core competency. Um, now the the I guess the paradigm has switched. Whereas wait, so the, at people, that time for yeah. me, you were a broker. Your mm-hmm. job was to dispose of an asset. Correct. You're now saying what was unique about me is the asset was under pressure mm-hmm. because if it wasn't, you were that's what you did for a living. I mm-hmm. sold real estate. I transacted real estate right? in the distress field. Correct. Correct. Even when so, there wasn't distress, you were in the distress I'll, field. Yeah, I can get to that. But the There's the conclusion of the conclusion of that point, you got to find it. We're now the first phone call. So whereas it was the attorney, end of the process, time to sell. Now people are coming and saying, Greg, I know this is what you do. I've been waiting for the referral. Can you explain <laughs> bankruptcy to me? What does this mean? Should I keep paying? Should I stop paying? How do I negotiate this? Like, what's my plan? So as, okay. someone, mentioned, as someone mentioned before, you've got these big guys in the room that while the market was going up, they were great. They've got hundreds of millions of dollars. They've got, you know, these giant portfolios. And all of a sudden, I'm the grown up in the room because they've never seen a downturn. So they're so asking let's, me, let's just make that now point. what? I now think that's what? fascinating. Mm. So the market, right, in New York where you were operating was healthy, which means that you bought it at X and it was X plus. Right. The whole narrative you're now stating is things changed. The market changed, right? What changed? Coronavirus, interest rates, right? We have to set the narrative, right? People had a business plan where they were projecting, because that's what we do in real estate, projecting a future that doesn't exist based on way too many variables that Mm -hmm. didn't go the appropriate way. They're realizing that they are quote unquote underwater, which either means their equity is wiped out, they're gonna make less money, maybe it's even worth less than the amount they borrowed, right? And yeah. that's that's why this even exists today. Right? And the subject classes that we're talking about is hotels, rentals, condos, warehouse, industrial. No. So 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 yeah, I'm going to just jump in for a second. Please. Not every situation is the same, and there's this there's different types of distress. And and when you say you want to tell a guy to go into bankruptcy, that may be right, but you know it may be horribly wrong. To be extremely successful, and everybody you have to make many, many, many mistakes. You have to get your ass kicked. You have to fall I'm down and it. get up because you don't learn from your successes. You learn from your failures and your mistakes. And then what makes a guy who fails a lot successful is that they think about their mistakes and they do a postmortem on them and they make sure that they never repeat that same mistake twice. And I've had the privilege of making so many mistakes, I can't even remember them all. But, you know, um, you got to be willing when you play this kind of game and you're taking big risks, you have to be willing to win and you have to be be willing willing to lose. lose. I think it's a huge point in that needs to be said more, especially now with all these developers getting rocked. With the it's egos, really, the lenders, it's really and the not borrowers' about, egos. It's not about that you lost, it's what you're going to do now. Right. right? And there is, by the way, <laughs> This is everyone in this room looks to me like they're young enough not to have been doing business in 1981. I was doing business in 1981. Okay, the prime rate was 14 percent. But had it increased from 78 at two to 14? Yes. yes, yes. It, That's through crazy. Jimmy Carter it went through the roof. It was five or four. Okay, 
And and the fr I, my first house out of law school in Cleveland, Ohio, in 1981, I had a 16 percent mortgage. So wait, wait, are you telling me it's going to come back? Sorry, are you, are you telling me it's going to come back? Well, I don't think that we're going to see that type. Of High five, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I don't think we're out of the woods. And I wait, do can I ask you a question on that? Yeah, had you acquired that asset, even though it's single that home, knowing the rate? So this is post that occurring, meaning your acquisition was at a reset value. It wasn't yeah, in a transitional correct. Yes, value. Absolutely, absolutely. That's crazy. But what, but what that did is it exposed me to what happens. And then in my experience, the biggest disaster was the Tax Reform Act of 86, where everyone in real estate got zapped and everyone's having failures. And we had the Resolution Trust Company and smart folks figured out how to make money. So the question is, what's going on now? And what's going on now is what happens over and over, but we haven't seen it in 30 years. Okay, I have two sons in the real estate business, both run little real estate hedge funds, and I say to them, guys, and we started talking in December of 22, right? So I was gone the last few months. I was traveling. I just got back. And, and I said to them, in the first two quarters of 23, the market's going to seize. There will be no transactions. And there are very few transactions, right? Anything over $25 million is basically not happening unless it's distress or unless someone is, um, uh, has no choice because they have to give back an asset. But no one is voluntarily transferring property. And the reason for that is, while it's changing, and by today it has changed from January, this continuum is where the sellers believed in yesterday's capitalization rates and the buyers were looking forward to tomorrow's capitalization rates. That's right. And what about the banks? Uh, the, the banks are the dumbest people on earth, and all they ever do is just follow each other. And we can talk about them in a minute. Wait, let's go back. Say it again, because I think it's the banks really awesome. are the no, dumbest no. people sellers. In the world. <laughs> sellers are thinking about about what are the say that again about the sellers. sellers are uh, someone who has a real estate asset in yeah. January of 2023 that thought they wanted to sell it, and I'm going to give you a great example in a second. Thought it was worth. So, what is a capitalization rate? Capitalization rate is how you value a piece of real estate. In a moment. In, in any asset. How do you value any asset? I want to go buy a shoe store. How do I value Correct. a shoe store? Correct. Or I want Walmart, or I want IBM, or I want a building. So it's a capitalization rate. Which every equals business, net operating income over value. So right. Every business generates pre-tax income or loss, right? Let's assume you're not buying a loss company unless you're buying distress. So any in, in, in the world of corporate finance, it's EBITDA. In the world of real estate, it's NOI, net operating income. Right. And so you have net operating income. You take that and you divide it by a capitalization rate. Now, what is capitalization rate? But there it you is, solved for value. It is the yield you will accept for that asset. Well, what the hell does that mean? Return of return investment. Right. So so how do, how do you know what the right cap rate is? Right? And and so the way I like to tell explain this to folks is, you know, let's take four different investments. Let's take US government treasury securities, corporate bonds, a suburban apartment building that's 95% occupied, and a meth lab, okay? And you have an opportunity to invest in any of those. Which I think is really important because people don't realize all of us, we're talking about real estate, are competing with Anything that you can invest. It's, it's Any capital dollar investment. investable. We are right? talking about making a return on I thought, I thought on you were going to say the profitability of the meth lab, which most people don't realize. Right. I but thought the that's where I was going. We'd all be but, in meth but, if But it now was legal. let me tell you what, what becomes very clear. Okay? So let's assume you wanted to make $100,000 a year. How much do I have to invest in each of those four assets to yield me $100,000? That's cap rate. Right. It is the risk level. So what's the risk on U.S. government securities? In Zero. January, it was probably 3%. Today, it's probably 4%. So if you wanted $100,000 a year net income at a three cap rate deal, you take $100,000, you divide it by 3%, and that says you need $3,333,000 to write a check to buy U.S. Treasury securities, and it will pay off 100000 a year. Now, let's say you want corporate bonds, and they're paying a 7% yield. So now I take my $100,000 that I want, and I divide it by 7%, and I only need $1,428,571 to generate $100,000. And why? Because there is a risk differential. 
GE might go out of business. The U.S. government, not so much. Okay, now let's go to my suburban apartment building in New but Jersey. Doesn't the risk go up? Well, no, that's what he's saying. That's what I'm saying. That's the what he risk just said. goes up, which is why the cap rate goes up. Goes up. And when the cap rate goes up, prices go down. Think about a cap rate like an interest rate on a bond. As interest rates rise, the bond value goes down. I, 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 so, I get that. I get so now, now let's take all the take, banks about that. Now let's that's take, why they went under. Let's take the apartment building. So probably a ten cap rate deal. So in order to get my hundred thousand dollars, I only mil. need to invest a million dollars. And I'm going to come back in a minute as to why real estate is great because how do we lever it? Okay, but let's just leave that alone. So three point three million if I'm buying U.S. Treasury securities. One point one point four million yep. if I'm buying corporate bonds. A million for real and. And what that says is, what what's the, the I'm getting there. What's right. the risk you're going to lose <laughs> your investment? Now, if I'm investing in a meth lab, I want, I want a hundred percent annualized return because the risk is so high, and the likelihood is I'm not seeing a penny. So, in order for me to make a hundred grand in a meth lab, all I have to do is write a check for a hundred thousand right. dollars. That is what cap rates are. They represent the level of risk associated with the investment. And as interest rates rise, the base of cap rates rise. Mm -hmm. And so if you if I took my three, seven, ten, and hundred percent and moved it from January to today, where let's say average interest rates are now five percent, so now I need to go from if I'm borrowing the money from three to eight, from seven to twelve, from ten to fifteen, and from a hundred to hundred and five percent. Right? So that tells you the risk level. The cap rate you choose should be commensurate with the risk. Now, why is real estate great? So you could take a million bucks and generate your $100,000, 10 cap rate. But if right. I went to the bank and I borrowed 70%, now instead of putting up a million dollars, I'm going to put up – so 100000 on a million is 10%, right? Mm -hmm. So now if I had 100000 of NOI – give me a calculator again. Come on, HP. If I had 100,000 of NOI and I borrowed 70%, 700,000 right. at 6% interest, 6% 6 6 of 700,000, 6 of 300, uh, $420,000, right? Right. So now I take, uh, oh, sorry, $42,000. So I take my 100,000, I take 42,000 off of that. Now I have 58,000 on 300,000. Right. And I just got a 19.33%, not a 10% return on my money. Okay, Levered. Levered, yeah. Levered, levered, right? And if I really want to be dumb, I can lever it up if someone's stupid enough to lend it to me. And the higher I can lever it up, the higher my return. The as long as, as, long the, as the market can, trends appropriately. Right. And well, that's what we're so, talking. We're talking about the trending is not appropriate. The no, trending no, is it's never going to happen. He's saying a baseline I'm, I'm analysis. You, oh, this is 101 why you're doing the right. game. So now I'll give you another example, okay? Let's assume you have an unbelievable asset. You have a, tr a, a credit tenant on a triple net lease, and it's $100,000 of net income. And you're in a 3% market, a three cap rate market. You, will, you can sell that theoretically for $3.3 .3 million. Now, let's assume that interest rates went to seven, and you're now in a seven cap rate market. If you, now, what's the value you're building? You now have a building that's worth less than half of that. Correct. Your right, but you have debt above that. Is, that. Right. right. And that's the situation we're finding ourselves in. So what does that mean? So how do you get out of it? Well, or, before we get out of it, it's a question, of, different people have to get out of it in different ways because, the, so the first thing is, who's our persona? Is it a single asset? Is the guy personally guaranteed? Is there any other issue? Are there created documents, as you refer to things? Or you seem built, to think right? they don't exist. No, I no, mean, I, boy, do I know they exist. And, and the key that. is not to. Look, it's taken 50 years to understand what you can and can't do. But Maybe. But at the end of the day, what's going to happen is, the lenders are going to shut down. They're not making loans. It's very hard to get loans today, almost impossible. And, and so people that are really desperate are going to go to secondary and other sources. Um, rescue capital? And, well, but rescue capital is smart capital. And, and, They're very smart. Agreed. You know, and, yeah. and, and rescue capital will make More money. More advantage. I've actually invested in a couple of, like, I won't tell you the names of the funds, but some of these rescue funds. But you'll bleep them. But but <laughs> only because only because this is really the time to do that. But 
but debt is not going to be available. So what you really have to look at it is, so I started saying the, the market's going to seize. No one's going to do a transaction. And then come September, the first guy that just can't hold on anymore and he yields to take his what was once a three or four cap rate deal yeah. and sell it at 10 cap rate, yeah. the next day the market collapses. Literally, Literally the, the market, market collapses. collapses. And that will happen in the third quarter of this year. Wait, Maybe. when you say market collapses, I'm trying, I'm trying and then I'd love to hear man. about you so know, Greg and Leo. Market collapses, meaning they know they're out of the equity. Meaning, what does that okay. mean? When you say market okay. collapses, Even what, does that, so what does that mean? I'm going to refer you to a story in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. I forgot where I read it. I was on a boat when I read this about a month and a half I ago. I think I even put it on my, on my LinkedIn. Did I send it to you? Of no, a, of a no. building in San Francisco. The building was purchased in 2019 for $320 million. Mm -hmm. How much? 320. $320 million. In 2022, they tried to sell it, mm -hmm. and they couldn't get any offers greater and $180 million. Well, so they pulled it. What do you mean they pulled it? They didn't sell it. They oh, didn't okay. transact. Okay, okay. It sold two months ago in San Francisco, mm -hmm. $60 million. Okay. That's what I mean. Value wait, vaporization. Wait, wait, wait. Value vaporization. No, no, but let's let's just talk about what that meant. But that's so San Francisco. So 320 was someone had a certain amount of equity and there was a certain amount of debt above this sales price. Well, so they had that, a sales price based on a cap rate that was a yesterday cap rate. Agreed. And now the markets have changed. So they go to the market and they can only yield 60 million, right. which means they're out and the bank takes that loss, and right? They lost uh, all uh, their Assuming equity. there's a mortgage. Equity is, at, then I'm assuming it was levered somehow. Yeah, right? but, but, some but, the, but the audience might not understand what you're saying. So let me run it by. Sure. 320 million, there was, let's assume there was a $150 million loan. On the property, More. okay. It was a bigger loan. Okay, sure. what three two hundred to twenty? Whatever. Let, 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 let's build, build perspective. Three hundred twenty million, two hundred twenty million mortgage. Okay, value now is sixty million. That means that that building that was worth three hundred twenty million now worth sixty million has a negative. What? How much is it? So now the question is, what? Is how, much by him? How, how, how much? How much? How much? Two sixty? No. No. Minus, uh, no. It, it, well, it has. A, it has no value because no one's assuming that debt. No, that I, I want to talk about the negative down. value for the audience. So, okay, so, so, so if it's 200 minus 60, you got $140 million negative value. Of, and who's responsible for debt. that? Of who's responsible for that? Well, that depends. Maybe the bank, maybe the borrower, maybe someone else. And that's the restructuring market right there. Wait, wait, that's wait, the restructuring market. I just want to ask a quick question about that. So now the bank took that loss. The equity knew they were out, and we assuming they're Why smart. Why do you say the bank took that loss? Because there the might bank, be a billionaire backing it up. No, 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 no. If it, if it got sold, there was a deal. The bank was involved in the deal. Okay, but, but let's talk about a typical deal, okay? In, in a deal where there isn't consent, right? You'd never get here. There is no way you can sell a building that's encumbered with $200 million of debt for $60 million unless the bank raises its hand and says, Okay, I'm okay with that. Okay. Not in, not correct. You can't have bankruptcy. Not not correct either. No, because no, I'll we, tell you. Because we, we, wait, 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 wait. Before we get into the nuance, they did agree. So the bank said we agree. We're, they had we're, to. We're fucked, was, I don't right? know. I don't. Right. For, let me just for, for the record. The I don't know if there was debt. But on I'm just asset. saying. So now <laughs> let's say there was debt. The bank says we're fucked. Sell it. They get back whatever they get back. Fifteen cents on the dollar. Twenty cents on the dollar. The bank's investors are us, the American public, our depositors, right? Where they then were entrusted to make that. Like, who takes the loss? Oh, are not we going there? No. no, 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 let's not go there. No, no, but who but, takes but, the but, loss? But, Meaning, but, you could but, be talking about the bondholders on a CMB. A shareholder, yeah. a shareholder derivative litigation. So no one that anyone feels so of, bad about no, it. No, 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 we you feel know? bad about but, all of them. But, just, but, but it isn't a question. Someone is taking a hit. That hit. The economy is taking, taking a, hit. a hit. Why and, is the and it isn't, taking a hit? Why it is isn't, wait, 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 Leo, one second. It isn't, it isn't that someone's taking a hit. It's the question of who is going to take the hit and what does that mean? And there is a silver lining yeah, to all this. Yeah, what's the opportunity okay. from it? I always like so, to hear that. So firstly, For who? So right. firstly, if a banker has a macadam of intelligence, he does not want the asset. Correct. A banker in the best of times can't manage real estate. Mm -hmm. That's right. And in, in this is far from the best of times. And so the last thing the banker wants, they will if they have to, and what's happened in the past in these situations is that the banks basically 
took all their losses and, and split it off into a bad bank <laughs> and sold it to the feds. And yes, the U.S. government paid. But, so the U.S. But, government. Well, which is the U.S. At that time, and they slowly. <clears throat> are you talking about 2008? Disposed, no, well, the government is always going to bail out the banks because, as, as, as Mayor Koch said, too big to fail bullshit, too big to jail. 2008, how did 2008 get out of 2008? Let me remind everybody well, what they happened. they kept values, though. It Hold on. What he's saying didn't happen in 08. No, no. Well, he's, he's talking about, I'm talking about the, the mantra of too big to fail. Government bails out the private lenders, okay, in 2008, how? There was a short sale. There was a short sale model built. What happened? Prices of residential homes went down. There was a 2008 financial crisis. Residential homes went down. Now those homes have uh, loans on them that are worth more than the residential property. So they went to Obama and they went to the other Republican president, I forgot what his name is, Bush, and they created, uh, they created a law that says, we the government, we, the government, are going to work with the private lenders, okay, to, 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 to do short sales in order for those people that had a dream home now have a shit home. Hold on. Have a shit home. Hold on. And it's not worth anything. We do not want to destroy. We do not want to destroy. We, the government, don't want to destroy the American dream. We want to give our our uh, citizens a second shot at owning property, okay? So we're coming up with the system as follows. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase, they all do a kumbaya on the table, and the government says, you're gonna appraise these properties that you gave loans on, and whatever that value is, I'll give you an example, million dollar house, now worth $500,000, and you bank are owed eight hundred thousand dollars, or the three hundred thousand. The three hundred thousand dollars we will put back to you through a coupon that we're going to give you. Now, I, what I want to say, hold on, hold on. But now, what I want to say, but now what I want to say, is there isn't for these commercial borrowers an Uncle Sam. There is only regulatory investigations for them. There isn't a body. There, there is. The government didn't pay the banks on short sales. What did they do? They, the only thing that the government did was they told the banks that they, if they were federally chartered, they had to make uh, modification loans with their, lend, with their borrowers and if they agreed to permit them to do short sales. But almost none of and the And they will pay them it. back the money. No. No, the but by the way, the government stop, never stop, paid stop, them that's back incorrect. the money. Stop. Let's just, let, can we just, they paid them back the money. Uh, I, I would I would love to understand that because I'm that's new to me. Okay. Okay. I, okay. I've never seen that. Okay. okay. My, my and firstly, that's why short sales stop. By the way, they, they, they stop because short sales. Short sales happen all the time. They're commercial short sales. It's just not nobody's funding that the, a short <clears> sale by definition simply means that the property's underwater. I agree. And that and but that, that means and it's that, worth less and that than the government debt. and that the lender is willing to accept less than the debt in order to satisfy the mortgage and prevent I agree. the transfer. I agree. If I there's agree. money being transferred from the government to the bank, I I'm unaware show of that. You, I'm, I'll maybe, show you okay. the Obama, just, Obama Just look. from, the, from <coughs> that fact, that. I'd love to hear from Greg because he's doing that on commercial deals in New York. So, Greg, tell us, like, I'd like to understand what you were speaking about, where you are in the process, what you're doing, and then what you see. All right. So, you had mentioned before that there were situations with the lender and the borrower uh, who were sort of trying to figure out what happens and the bank is saying they don't understand how to run real estate or that's not their primary job. The bank is in the lending institution. They make their money off loans. They do not make their money and nor do they want to have a real estate division under that bank that runs and uh, deals with the daily headaches of management and maintenance of these especially multifamily buildings. Loan so, to own. They right, don't want no, that. The banks do not want that. That is the opposite of what they want. Now, I've when we say thought, bank, can we just clarify? Do you mean all people who lent money? Any, any look, if we're, let's just keep it local for 
you know, a moment with yeah. the New York communities and Valley so not, and Signature. So not debt funds? No, we're talking about commercial banks. Lenders. I don't want to hit that yet. Okay. So Not non-bank banks. Okay. Commercial right. banks. Commercial okay. banks. Right. So we're in a position right now where we are the go-between with a lot of borrowers and a lot of lenders, either the banks or the special servicers that have taken over these loans that are servicing the debt on the CMBS or on the, you know, on behalf of the bondholders. Those are your clients. We're trying to. Those are your clients now, I guess. Right. So historically, we've been on both sides. We were hired by a lot of lenders over the years um, when they were doing, whether it was in a bankruptcy and the borrower's exclusivity ran out, the lender would file the lender's plan and they would hire us. So we worked a lot of times for these banks, uh, for the special servicers, for the hard money lenders, the loan to own guys uh, across the board. Now we're creating a market. Mm-hmm. To sell at whatever the Correct. highest value is Correct. for what's there. Right. Yeah. So what we specialize in are the foreclosures, meaning the UCC and judicial. UCC nines. That. Yep. I will get into that in a minute. The UCCs and how those are leading to more Chapter 11s. And we, again, specialize in the Chapter 11, these sales. But also under this plan of reorganization, it's not just a sale necessarily. Right. As you know, you got to put forward, by definition, a plan. Right. So here's what we're going to do, Your Honor. We're not just doing this to buy time. We're not just doing this to save the transfer tax, right? We have a plan, and that plan involves hiring Greg and his team. They might try to sell it. They might try to recapitalize it. They might try to find new financing. We're going to figure this out, and as you mentioned before, we're a month away from some event that's going to lead us to right ourselves from the situation, which is why we need to file the 11 now to stop the UCC foreclosure, We've already tried to do what we can with the TROs, and we've tried to basically get the sale adjourned. Trying to buy the time. You couldn't buy, buy the, time. the time. Couldn't buy the time. So that's why they're filing. Right. Um, but rewinding. But at the end of the day, mm. you are, it's a very standardized way mm. of creating a market and transacting. It right. is a transaction. You sit in making sure mm. that the highest value either for the lender or the borrower occurs mm. under these conditions. Right. So rewinding before I go forward, though. So when we're in this position, and again, sometimes it's lender representation, sometimes it's borrower representation, which is usually a referral from an attorney or, you know, if a trustee hires us directly to liquidate. But in either case, these conversations that we're having a lot of times with the servicer and the borrower is their posturing or the bank, even we're dealing with, again, the names I mentioned before. And they're saying, sure, we have no problem owning this. We'll take it back if you don't give us X amount. Mm -hmm. They always say it. They're like, if you don't give us our, you know, hundred cents on the dollar, even right. They don't ask for the personal guarantee. They ask for the personal guarantee. I'll address that in a second. But what they, even the hard money lenders, are like, if I don't get my the UPB plus the late fees plus the penalties plus the contract interest plus the default of twenty four percent. I'm happy to take this back. And, and that's operate what Jacob it. was saying is like these schmucks. Like no. everyone they, they sees it. it. They don't mean it. Right. They're, they're meaning it's a bluff. It. Right. So as you're alluding to, this is not something they actually want. This is a way to get a higher payoff or not to get a reinstatement at a much lower DPO with a lower What's interest rate. What's that acronym? Rate. Discounted payoff. Mm-hmm. So Meaning the court doing, in your situation can mm-hmm. force to lower it. Once, so once in a while, if it's in a you know federal bankruptcy court, the judge ju- uh, does have autonomy to play around with those numbers and do what's called a cram down. It's not so frequent, especially if there's a judgment in state court. The federal judges don't like to do what's called a Rooker Feldman and overturn or go against what the state court says. I'll talk about that. Yeah, you can talk about that. But essentially, they're going to uphold that. And the bankruptcy court judges will usually stick to what's on the docks, especially if there's equity there. So if it's underwater and the equity was burned off a long time ago, what will happen is then the judge is faced with a decision. I've seen cases where a judge has said, I'm not granting even pre-petition, meaning before they filed the bankruptcy, a default interest rate. I'm just going to grant contract interest rate, which is, let's say, the 6%, not the 24%. You're talking and, about the confirmation plan. Uh, well, when the judge is deciding how much is owed on if there's a deficiency which, judgment. Can we, can we stay macro? Because that's, you know, you're saying that the borrower may be on a sale still responsible. But at the end of the day, let's just talk about value. So they come to you right now and they're saying, have this transaction occur. Right? Right. But, it, but again, let me let me finish. Before we get there, let, the let judge then can say, they do have the power to do this. They can say, I'm not allowing 
any default interest pre-petition before they file. And I am not allowing any interest post-petition after they filed the bankruptcy. They do have the power to do that. It doesn't happen that often. Stop the clock. They do not do a full cram down. Again, this depends upon how much equity is there. Okay, if there's a lot of equity, the judge will typically say, I'm gonna abide by the loan documents. You're a big boy or girl. You sign the loan documents, whatever the default rate is, you owe it. Similar to what just happened with uh, Croman and with um, uh, the Maverick. Maverick. So anyway, uh, in that case scenario, then they will let the meter run. In the case of when there's no equity, but in his and case, running in San in a vacuum, Fran, where there's no value, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. Well, right? We don't know where that. That was not in a bankruptcy. The re- one of the things you guys, I mean, should really talk about is. Uh, does a bankruptcy make sense on an asset, right? There's and so it, many strategic well, reasons just, to follow. Just let, it, let Greg finish. So, yeah. so now, so you're, 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 you figured out now what you, you do, you, you, your role is to make sure that transaction is kosher. Right. It occurs. So in, you know, as the opposite of a, a brokered, you know, a regular bread and butter fee position sale that a broker could do, they get a seller that says, I want $25 million for my property. They could literally make one phone call have a buyer that says 25, Boom. done, Boom. your deal. It's never that easy. Otherwise, we wouldn't get the fees we get. But conceptually, you could do it in the phone call. What we do is a lot different. We have to run a full process. So even if we know that we got the perfect guy for this asset and he's going to pay up um, just short of him paying the lender in full, the secured creditor, the unsecureds, whatever liens are on it, the best uh, you got is enough estate. for the deed, you know, that the borrower is happy with the number as well. Just short of all of that, we have to run a full process. We must show at the end of the process a full marketing report saying we've gotten 56 offers, we've signed 100 NDAs, we've done 30 inspections, whatever the numbers are. We do screenshots of everywhere it's marketed, social media, websites. This is a process that needs to be packaged to show that this was not given to our brother or our cousin or friend for below market because it was distressed. You created a marketplace in a very specific manner. Okay. Correct. Then what? So we run the process. Sometimes the number is high enough to pay off the secured lender and have some leftover for the borrower or not. And sometimes there's a shortfall, in which case typically the, the lender will credit bid. They take the asset back. And depending upon how big the delta is between what the borrower owes and what the number is, they may or may not seek a deficiency judgment. And even if they get one, which is very hard to get the deficiency judgment, collecting on it is next to impossible. So whereas a lot of borrowers are worried about this, what we've seen typically from you know the, the special servicers is they won't try to exercise these rights and remedies to get that money back or garnish wages or whatever they're so threatening. It's just not worth their so time. So let's, let's just the put, borrower let's just put a was a terrible a person and they hate them. So now what are you seeing? You are, mm. as you stated, right. you were up for three nights in a row. Mm. Okay. So what's happening? What do you na- now tell us about the market? Because mm. what, what Jacob was saying was first six months is seized up yep. and then it's going to collapse. What are you seeing? Right. So the UCC foreclosures, these article mines is that's the canary in the coal mine. When people are filing these, it's essentially, um, I'm sorry, (laughs) let me start that one again. The UCC foreclosures is when the lender is saying, I'm not going to even exercise a judicial foreclosure, you know, as the senior, which is collateralized by the property, because this is going to take two, three, four, five years. However, because I have the MES loan, I can do this in 30 to 60 days. I can have the membership commercially reasonable, which is why we get hired. And I can take back the membership interest in the LLC. And then I essentially either become my own lender if I'm the senior, or I am then beholden to the senior secured lender. Um, But this is the first step, in which case then the borrower files a chapter 11, which imposes what's called an automatic stay. It stops the foreclosure process. And the UCC nine sale. Correct. And puts the bankruptcy in place, which then buys them more time to figure out their plan. Yeah, but I'm I'm, I'm a, a, so that's a strategy. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing on the transactions now? Are you seeing... Out of the 800 you see, 500, mm. what percent is actually the bank is taking it back and what are they doing? Mm. What are you seeing right now? Or is the amount of debt outstanding enough for a new buyer to come in? As mm. per what Jacob's saying is no one's doing shit because it still doesn't work even at that value. So I'm curious, right. what are you seeing in the moment? Right. So are you transacting nothing, or are the bank's taking it all back? No, we are transacting. And so what do those deals look like? So how, how, 
give us an example of a deal. You know, what's the what's the asset? What's the NOI? And and what was the structure? And how did you come in and redo it? Okay, so typical deal for us, and it used to be, as we mentioned, hotels or hospitality and retail were the challenged asset classes a few years ago, and everyone said they're toast. However, they came back very nicely. Very nicely. Everyone said multifamily. It's you know a coupon, money in the bank, the safest investment you could ever make. And in and what we hadn't mentioned, we talked about COVID. We talked about interest rates going from 3% to 6.5%. Legislation, right? But Legislation. we did not talk about the rent laws in 2019 right. changing. Right. That was the beginning of the end. So any building that was a $10 million building, to pick an easy number, that they had $7 million worth of debt on and $3 million of equity is now worth five to six. So now what? That's where we are in the cycle. Right. So and how, what so, happens and, there? And what's the debt stress? So the debt's, uh, it's underwater. What do you come in Correct. and do? So basically, you're only doing it through a 363 sale because you're wiping out the balance, right? No, no. So under the 11, a lot of times yeah. what we're doing- oh, so it's a reorg. Or it's a reorg, or if we get brought in, and they don't want to file the 11. Sometimes we're even having attorneys that we recommend draft a petition that they send to the attorneys for the bank and say, don't make me file this. We're ready, we're prepared, we've drawn up the documents. We don't want to file, you don't want us to file, we can schlep this for a year or two. Let's, let's do a consensual process. We'll do this in 90 to 120 days. We will agree to whatever the results are and you will either get a sale and then we can figure out if there's a deficiency or our borrower will backstop the amount and pay off whatever amount if there's a shortfall. But you're, so you're acting as an intermediary, so someone else is buying it. Tell me yeah, what, who's the, the, new buyer, buyer? Tell me what yeah. the buyer structure looks like. Okay, so in that case scenario, mm -hmm. when we have a buyer that is gonna come and purchase the building that used to have been worth $10 million, and now let's say it's worth $9 million or $8 million, in that case, we're having the conversation with the bank who started off saying, we don't care, Wait, we'll take the keys that back. was worth five. Give me an example of what a buyer does when the debt's underwater. Can you, have you transacted those kinds of deals? Correct. So if that buyer comes in and we run a process and the bank says, we see that the market is five to six, you got a six and a half. It's not enough to cover it, but we're going to take it. The borrower is completely out of the equity. There's no money for them. They're walking away. It used to be that if there was, you know, kind of in the middle, they'd make a couple of bucks. The, the borrower would say, you know what? I'll go away easily. Give me a few hundred grand. I'm gone. Take the deed. Do it whatever you want. Now the borrower is walking away. As long as the bank says, I'm going to release you from the recourse, no personal guarantees. Just give us the keys back. Play ball. We'll do a consensual sale. So in that case scenario, we so have a new a, buyer. A commercial come. short sale. Correct. But and that's new buyer because, comes. But, can I just say, that's yeah. because the market is close to the debt. And if I'm not mistaken on what Ish, you're saying yes. is, that's about to change. Where it's the debt- changed, It's already yeah. changed. Right, so that means that the market is way below the debt. Have you seen that yet? You meaning you're seeing yeah. the banks just take that loss? So we're not seeing what Jacob mentioned about a 300 and some odd million dollar building going to 60. We're seeing the $10 million building going to, let's say six, where the debt's seven, and if the borrower is backstopping that and we get a buyer, which is why they hire us, if everyone says it's worth this and we find this plus 15 or 20 percent and we find that guy and we can match it up about or a few bucks short, the building's transacting. We have a third party buyer that sees something that the other buyers don't. The bank's saying we're cashed out close enough. And at that point, the borrower might have to cough up a couple. Bucks. I have two questions. Sure. One, how many transactions have you been brought in on since January? Um, 26. And how many and have closed? Right now, I think we're probably around mm, a little less than half of them. Okay. So, so, but hold on. We're in the midst of $800 million of transactions, and some of them might have been legacy, that 26 number of all bankruptcy and foreclosures, UCC and judicial foreclosures, which is 5x of what I've ever seen and it makes 2008-9 a non-event. But but 8-9 is a different world. 8-9 is all residential. Yeah. And it did, it completely deprived American homeowners of their homes. Homes are all owned by Blackstone and yeah. other big groups, and that's yeah. all going to change again. While. But 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 what's going to ha what's happening now is a double whammy. You're getting to see a number of deals that you will continue to see. That level of transactions with those kinds of guys go higher. will always be there and will continue to grow. Right. But, but we're about to see a different situation because you're dealing with buildings that 
a prospective buyer believes continues to have that kind of value. Let me tell you why I believe that changes. Because let's go back to our example of the $100,000 building at a uh, 10 cap rate. That was when you could buy that building with 5% debt. By September, October, rates are now over 7%, right? You're going to, let's assume you're at a 7% commercial mortgage rate. Let's take that building and if the rents were uh, $35 a foot, let's double them. Imagine overnight we're giving the landlord we're going from $35 a foot in rent to $70 a foot. So now I have added, let's say I doubled my NOI. So now I have, now watch this, this is what's going to make it all different. So yesterday, I had $100,000 of NOI at a, uh, uh, at a 10 cap, right? And it was a million buck value. Now we're going to 200 million of NOI. 200,000. I'm sorry, we were, I'm sorry, 200,000 of NOI. And we're adding seven points to that. We've doubled the rent and the building's only increased $100,000. Okay? And on the really, on the very expensive buildings, what I would call the institutional grade buildings, like the DHL center, buildings that were trading at three to three and a half cap rates, well, now they're trading at seven and a half. And when the, and rent, the rent didn't double. And the rent didn't double. But let's assume that even if the rent doubled, okay, so the building's worth half. I have a building that was worth, you know, a lot of money. And it's lost half its value simply because of cap rates, right? May I sell that for you, please? Well, hmm. no, I'm keeping that until I drop dead. <laughs> Can I say but, something? Wait, wait. But, but I want to say wait, one wait. last thing about Finish. forgiveness of debt because your clients all need to know that even if they get off their guarantees and they go, thank God, they have a tax liability. Yeah. They have forgiveness of debt liability. Massive phantom gains are And so let's assume that they nice. had they had – uh, a three million uh, a, a seven million dollar loan, and the bank took four million. They have three million of income, and they have zero cash. Yep. Okay. They have reportable income. That's dangerous, and there are very nominal ways to to avoid that in a um, in a way that won't get challenged. Wait, and, can I just finish with Greg? Yeah. Who are the who's that market now? So who are those buyers, and are they plentiful, or is that, or should everyone who's a real estate purchaser or even thinking about it, should they just be getting involved and in seeing what you have? Meaning, those are deals that'll t transact. Or I always thought it was the bank takes to credit bid, like all these banks that said, "Oh, we'll take it back, we'll take it back." You find them taking it back. They take it back when no one is remotely in the neighborhood that they are owed. Then what happens? <clears throat> then they, they sit hold it. on it for three months, and then they start to pull their hair out. And then they put it into what's called REO, which is real estate owned. And that's where the bargains are. But, but what's gonna, it doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. I am predicting that starting in September through December, you're going to have very few of the kinds of deals that you're doing. They're coming back, but they're going to be done – the banks are either going to foreclose or kick the can down the road, right? You'll see a lot of lenders just say, I'll extend you six months, I'll extend you nine months, because they don't want it, they don't know what to do. And it's not like the, le the borrowers are bad. Uh, unless the borrower has you know, done something inappropriate, uh, the lender is better off letting the borrower extend the time, work with them, because the borrower will do a better job saving the asset. And the borrowers that are walking away today are the ones that – cannot save the asset, either because of their own personal situation or because of the situation with the asset. And and so that's what's going to happen starting then. But then by the beginning, then this whole thing is going to be over by the middle of 2024. From Je I'm predicting from January 24 until June of 24 is the entire period where fortunes are going to get made by buying these assets out of REO and out of your kind of situations. And then the market's going to start to recover. And then there's going to be another six-month tail. And all the guys that didn't get in the first six months are going to try to play around on the last six months. But the numbers are going to change. The opportunities are going to change. And, and, and it's over. I, I, I think of the marketplace as a clock with six being the bottom and 12 being the top. And I believe that we're somewhere around 
four twenty. And and the time to start buying is when you go right past five, and the top to, time to stop buying is before you hit seven. And I believe that's the six month window that's going to be September through December, and the market will recover. But but you also have to buy different real estate this time, and it ain't. I wouldn't be. I personally don't view uh, urban office as a viable use, but that's where opportunities are if you can take it and change it. Can I just say something? Um, so to, to, to your opinion, I guess, bankruptcies will go down and uh, brokers would not be needed, Jacob? Brokers are always needed and bankruptcies are always going to happen because clients are also stupid. You've got to create the marketplace anyway. But, but, but are they bankruptcy go up isn't no? right. So, so bankruptcies are going to definitely go up. But for many, many reasons, not just in real estate. Correct. We're, we're gonna we're we're gonna see. But we're talking about real estate. No, but it have it's bankruptcy is not just real estate. Can I just, uh, let me make my point. Okay, so you have a valuable asset that was valuable three years ago. Today, it's teeter tottering like the Titanic. Uh, at you know, if something's worth three hundred million dollars at, at at debt, and it's worth three hundred million dollars now, it's now the the, the debt is higher. And and then I guess Greg comes in and, and sells it to an opportunist, right? At or above that after does the showings and does mm-hmm. the reports and the bankruptcy court says, yes, no problem. Well, you're not always in a you're sometimes you're in a prepackage, sometimes you're in a bankruptcy that's I'm, already there. Sometimes you right. put it into bankruptcy as yes. part of the deal, right? Right. right, right so right. I got a phone call. You know what? Finish and yeah, then I'll go yeah, to the yeah, next sure, one. Sure, sure. So 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 I just want to take your logic, Jacob, and you can go further. Now it's going to rise even higher. What is rising higher? The value of the debt is rising higher than the value of the property, not by 5%, not by 10%, but by 20 or 30 or 40. Now what is Greg doing? How is the debt rising? The debt's fixed. No, the debt is rising by default interest penalties, attorney's fees, all that, of course. Oh, well, you, okay. It's always accruing. So, but the, okay, so if it's, being rising, unpaid, forgive me. if it's being unpaid, being unpaid, if it's being unpaid, it isn't going to go through one of these processes. It's either going to end up in a bankruptcy <laughs> or a foreclosure really quickly within 90 to 100 Or a Dean and Lou situation, which we can talk about as well. That's a bankruptcy or a foreclosure. It's a different type of foreclosure. Correct. It's a consensual foreclosure. Right. But, 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 but the, what, what I think we've missed talking about is that the strategy for an owner in a distress situation really depends on many things unrelated to the asset. Absolutely. And I that, can agree more. And that the most important analysis for a real estate owner who's in deep shit is to analyze that person's financial exposure. And I'd like to bring a specific example to, to mind, if I may. I have a client, okay? Well, let's, why do you have a client? What do you do? Sure. Yeah, Hold actually, on, wait, wait, we're winding myself. even more. We keep going back <laughs> sure. one step to go back to sure. go forward. To sure, you. sure, sure. In a speed round of one minute, you had said you think it's four thirty. I'm curious to know what you and you and I'll weigh in as well. What time is it today? That's a four twenty. But okay. Plus. Oh, you said four twenty. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 oh, I, th- I think that's I a very think, interesting yes. number. Four twenty. I agree with Jacob. Next, you. You know, I'd, I'd love to get into like what I'm doing. You know, I can't get the transaction across the finish line and the difference in what we're talking about, which but give is me another the time variable. First. I don't know, because if I transact it, I'm on half built, right? I'm a builder developer. I want to rescue a half built asset where the bank is stating we no longer you, have faith. You should be making a bloody fortune right now. And what you need to do is make it known to the guys who are crying every night who've got half-built assets. I know of one property. Uh, I'll give you after, after this. I'll mm-hmm. give you the name. We just we just signed three of them, and but, I'll give you. But but on there's that. that. It's not that you can't get the deals. It's that you can't find them. Because once you find them, you'll be able to get them. How do you? Get I out got there? The, I can know. I have this story. The bank wait, is fronting we, we, right now. Yeah, but Every we have one. Bank we have is have the one dopest right now. developer known to man. And I'm going, I've been built 40 projects. Yeah. You don't build the fuck. Like, it's the weirdest conversation. I have to figure out how to make that happen. Well, what's the problem? What's the obstacle? Let's see if we can, can help So you. currently, well, I, no, wait, well, well, I want to know what time of what time day is it? it is. I'm 420. Oh, I, think, I, I think he's 100. It's between 
I'd say further along, 510. So you're saying that you think the absolute peak of a buying opportunity is almost right here, and then everything after 6 o'clock is a less fortuitous time to buy. So if we're at that 5, it's we're at the bottom. You're wait, saying wait, we're th- at the bottom. I think right I think now, we're, we, do I you feel like you're catching going a falling knife? Yes. Like even if you caught it, mm. you're winning. It's a reset value. Time. I think it's beginning strongly at six. Strongly disagree. And where do you, you think, think it's not? Strongly disagree with all of you. Mm-hmm. It's one o'clock right now, because you guys are not seeing what I'm seeing on the front line. We're working on a 53 building package in Upper Manhattan mm-hmm. and the Bronx, mm-hmm. all rent stabilized. You guys haven't read this in the real deal yet. You haven't seen it. We've been evaluating for the, all of the special yep. servicers. We see it from all these guys and. We're doing BOVs for them, meaning it's in the an opening value, stages, right? right? An opinion of value. We are in the opening stages. So to go back to that portfolio, you're in the opening stages, stages of the of bank's paying attention. It. So listen to what I'm saying. I'm saying that we're not going to see the deals that are the result of the disaster until somewhere around December of this coming year, and that my prediction is that you will. I, then if you're looking at where are we with the transaction market, I think you're 100% right mm. because, because the, the, you, are, you, you come in after the negative externalities have occurred and you're only seeing the negative externalities at the top of the mountain. And what I'm saying is that the negative externalities are now hidden underwater. That water is coming. That down, you're going to see them all. When that's going to start, I think – is somewhere so I think the market collapses between September and December, and I think buying opportunities, which is you're at one o'clock today. Right. I think you were at the beginning of the bottom or five ish starting in December. So we're probably very mm. close to where we think because you're thinking about transacting, and I'm mm. thinking about buying. whether the market is is able to transact. Okay, I hear what you're saying. So you're saying the market is not able to tra- transact. Right, it's not. And, uh, and, and when you're beginning, beginning when, beginning when, beginning when, beginning when. Beginning October? I believe that come October, you will see disaster because people will. And why October? Define disaster. Buyer can't sell? Buyer has no ability to hold on without uh, being faced with an imminent foreclosure sale or an inability to refinance his, to buy new insurance or an inability to replace his derivative swap to keep his interest rate from floating. So that's when it begins. That's when opportunity begins because now he has to find other investors to purchase he, his He's shit. not finding any investors. Right. He's out. Right. He's going home. It's the reset it's valuation the next guy. of the next guy The next who guy wins. is making the money. Correct. You're, the guys that you're helping in your the bankruptcies, you're just helping smooth out their losses. They're Absolutely. not winning anything ever. That's right. Well, first, I find that fascinating and love to just Leo to just jump in with what he does. They're not the developers that I meet are more realistic that they're that they're screwed, that they know they're trying to mitigate their down. So some of them, some of them know. Right. Like, because they're they were the tip of the spear. Right? right. When they had underwrote these deals and they're developing right. it, they hit right. Corona. Right. 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 The right. equity's gone. Like they knew they were so screwed. what they should do. What, what should they do, Jacob? They should not hire a bankruptcy lawyer until they fail at step one. And can what's I, step one? Can I tell you why you're wrong? Is, well, no, yeah, no, you no, will because no, you're a bankruptcy one. lawyer. <laughs> but, but the, oh, we heard. the first the thing lawyer. they should do, in my opinion, is go to the bank and I say, guys, we're in this together. I'm failing and you're, you're going to fail. And when I'm gone, you've got half-built shit and you don't know what to do with it. I, so I let, me, let me tell you what you need to say. I wanna, and you need to say to them, guys, here's the deal. You will let me off. All of them have guarantees. Okay, guys that do that all have PTs. How about the cross collateralization of the personal you're, home? Have you're, all that. Yes. you're going to lend me off the guarantee. Oh yeah. You're going to listen to I'm what I'm, I'm going to. I want to hear. This is a deal they're going to say yes to if it's presented correctly. You're going to let me off the guarantee. I will continue to work through this. You're not going to let me off the guarantee today. You're going to put the guarantee into limbo, That's and you're going to stop the the the, uh, the clock on interest. We're becoming partners, okay? I'm now working for you, bank. I get a monthly draw that you give me and you continue to fund through the loan, whatever. And I sell the, and you get a minimum of this and we split anything above that, dot, 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 or, but that's the, and so the bank wins because 
it has an exit with someone who really knows what they're doing and is only in the situation because of a systemic market event. May I reply? And well, when I'm done, yes. And uh-huh. so, and and this guy is more worried about his PG and losing his house than he is about working a deal with the bank because because he doesn't think the bank's going to work with him. But the bank's as afraid as he is, and 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 they have to understand how to go in there not from false strength and not from too much weakness, but from a practical reality. This is the only way we're both going to survive. That's the message to the bank. And in order for us to survive, you have to pay me enough to live. And when I'm done and I deliver a finished product and a C of O, if you take it, I'm off the guarantee. If I sell it and you get at least this, I'm off the guarantee. So that is perfect in writing, in a textbook, Hypothetically, Man. yes. What are you seeing on the street? Hold on, on the ground, line. Not the lenders, the even though they should, I agree with you. That's what they should be saying. They should be partners on this deal. Yep. Nonetheless, they press forward on a lot of them. Can and I? I'm going to give no, you. No, they do the thing you said. I'm, guys, give I'm you an a example. lender. You're a borrower. Guys, give guys, me my money. The concrete example that happened last week which we're doing a lot of talking right now about the history of real estate and we're going back and we're talking about cap rates and a lot of real estate stuff that real estate people know. But what we're here to talk about in the current level of distress in July of 2023, and I'm giving you the the perspective on what's happening real time, is that the bank or the hard money lender who bought the note from the bank is saying, forget that we're partners, that might make sense, it might be the best outcome, but we're pushing forward with the foreclosure and we're gonna force your hand. So I got a call last week. We met with this borrower two weeks before that. He said, I read the article in The Real Deal. I know you're the bankruptcy and foreclosure guy. I need your help. He shows up in my office. I walk him through everything, nothing. Follow up, get busy, forget about it. Friday afternoon, I get a phone call at 4.30 p.m. that says, I have a UCC foreclosure on Tuesday. They're gonna take my property. Do you have a lawyer that's going to work over the weekend, that's going to get this done, that's going to get everything done Monday, and we are done Tuesday to stop this UCC foreclosure? I said, let me make a few phone calls. Now, that's where these things are ending up. Wait, wait, so let's back up. Can I I say something? That's the opposite of this scenario, which is, Mm -hmm. and and, yes, speak, and I'll go. So let me tell you what I I do, right? So our firm restructures debt and equity. That's what we do, not only for real estate but for companies, okay, of all sizes, mainly middle market, okay, whatever middle market you want to define it as. But an attorney, not a restructuring attorney. I'm a restructuring attorney, exactly. Oftentimes, these cases do not come in as a bankruptcy. They come in through a commercial litigation of some sort. Lender has a judgment. uh, uh, Landlord has a judgment. There's a dispute with an estate. There's a breach of fiduciary duty on one of the partners, and they've pled the accounts with no money. They've left to Guatemala, right? Um, there's a dispute inside with the directors, the shareholders, and these properties are really left to debt. Other times, it's malfeasance, fraud. Mm-hmm. It's also uh, a general contractor walking off the job. Subcontractors not listening, someone dying, there'd be no, there's no insurance. There's mm-hmm. all types of situations that are bringing these bankruptcies to our office. But I think we're talking about very something very, very specific, specifically with lenders and borrowers. And I'll focus on that. What we have to recognize in each of these situations, and I want to respond to Jacob's assumptions that he has made about making a deal, um, a deal that is very difficult to refuse, it's refused all the time from the lender's side. And it's for a very simple reason. It actually has nothing to do with finance, has nothing to do with the law, how much you can sell it for, what buyers you have. It actually has to deal with, believe it or not, personality. One thousand percent and temperament. I agree with that too. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Temperament and personality. (laughs) Temperament and personality. And what is temperament and what is personality? I'll talk about personality in just this, right right now. I I wanna do that first. 
So the personality of the lender, okay, may be very aggressive. The personality of the lender may be a novice lender. The personality of a lender may be a CMBS holder. The personality of a lender may be an insurance company, a pension fund. So when a borrower comes to you with an issue, uh, they are thinking about their home, their family. They're thinking about how they want to finish this project and they can't. They're thinking, calling Greg and saying, hey, I need to, I need to sell this thing. I have a cross collateralization on my Hawaii property, my Louisiana property, my vacation home in the Hamptons. I'm going to lose everything. And then I say to them, well, what kind of lender do you have? And they always say the same thing. Why does it matter what kind of lender I have? I really just need you to help me figure out financially how to get out of it. And really what our firm is hired to do is hired to move the aggressor, okay, which is the lender, very, very, very far away from the prey, which is the borrower, okay? Because the lender wants to get to the asset as soon as possible, spring all the springing guarantees. Okay? But that's all fear. Yeah. Still not business like we were just discussing. Right, right. It's not. It's and emotion. A it's lot a, of it's, it's emotion. a lot of emotion. And, and the borrower also seems to believe, and this is what is happening, when you sit a borrower down or a tenant down, whoever is the one that's owing, the debtor owes the money, they're still thinking like it's 2018 and they're having a party. That their value, there's value in their property, that there's value in their product. And they don't believe that they're subprime. They don't believe that they're going to lose. That's what I meant by they're looking backwards at their cap rates. May I say, may I say, that's a practical point of view. And I'm talking about as a counselor <clears throat> before they go to y y yourself, uh, 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 Eric, or to Jacob, or to Greg. They're sitting in my office, and I'm not saying none of you do this, but they're sitting in my office for a good part of the session, frankly, drinking scotch tequila <laughs> or a glass of wine, forget. telling me their woes and trying to forget how, how they are not the person that they actually are. So what's not getting them to the table right. to you? <laughs> It's the fact that they can't psychologically believe themselves, they've, that they've put themselves in this situation. And anybody who's listening, if you, hear, if you hear anything, if you hear anything from this podcast, the first thing you gotta do is swallow your fucking ego. You gotta swallow your fucking ego. The condos you built, you made a mistake, my man. The, the, the rentals you try to build, you made a mistake. The fact that you cross-collateralized, whatever, your home and you thought you were going to be this, this great guy, you're wrong. And you know what you should be doing instead? Is you should be sitting down and saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give up my Hamptons house. I'm going to talk to the lender in a way that I'm going to work for him for as long as I can to make sure that I can sell, develop, and plan another day. 007, die another day, right? Live another day. The borrowers are living on borrowed time mm -hmm. and their personalities and their egos are not allowing them to move forward. And what does this do with my conversations as a, with the lenders? I don't talk about how they think they're on top of the world, my clients are top of the world. I tell the lender, listen lender, you gotta back up a little bit and not be so aggressive because I can kung fu your ass too. I could put you in a TRO. I could put you in a declaratory action. I can put you into places that you don't want to be. And it's that sheer effort, and I tell this to my clients all the time, it's that let me be the egotistical guy that wants to be in the forefront, the aggressive postured man. But when it comes to mediation, and that's another thing, they all come to me and says, we got to fight, we got to fight, we got to fight. And I'm like, no, 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 we can't fight. Mm. You, 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 you did a pre-negotiation letter where you offered a, a deed in lieu. 
you wrapped up and you pledged all of your shares. You cross collateralized your Hamptons home and your Ferrari. You sold your, 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 your second wife and your two children, and now you want to fight, you want me to get you out of it? Right. If you got a blank check with a million bucks and a $200 million loan, I'm your best friend. But if you want a practical way out of your situation, I tell my clients all the time, for every dollar in litigation that you spend, you get back 10 cents. For every dollar you spend in mediation, if there's a way out, a, a paved way out, you get $5 return. But that $5 return is going to guarantee you to get out to fight another day. That doesn't mean you're going to lose all of your assets, but it, 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 can, it could promise you a way back. And I think a lot of the borrowers and the debtors have to calm down and the lenders have to calm down because the lenders think they got the best lawyers, lenders think they got the best asset managers to when they can't sell their uh, uh, commercial real property and they have to put the, put, the, put, the, put the bid in and now they got a bunch of REO, they're losing and they're looking down the barrel of a, of a shareholder derivative action because the investments are not well, let, panning out. Let's, let's just quickly, they're not reading enough military history where don't fight force with force. You got you to gotta, you know, recoup, come back and figure the out a art different of angle. War, man. They need to the art of war real you. estate. So yeah, but, let but me just- What you were saying though is correct, but it's not just the lenders that need to dial it back. And, and the borrowers and the borrowers. And the borrowers. And the so, lawyers. So, and the lawyers. The lenders who are really driving the car at this point in time, they've got the cards. The borrower is saying, please, how do I get out of this? And can you restructure this loan? They don't have the leverage anymore. The banks are doing forensic analysis. They're trying to figure out, as we talked about before, did this guy one day take a dollar out of this account and put it another because now he's tripped all the recourse in the PG. That's what they're doing. The and lenders they, are checking. Like, hold like, on, like, hold on, hold on. They are. That's what they're doing. Okay, that's what the lenders that's are right. doing. This they're trying to gain analysis. leverage. Now they're trying to gain leverage. However, these lenders are just like us. They're just a bunch of guys and gals who are trying to do their day job and go home and do what they do at home. So if you hang up on them and if you don't return phone calls as a borrower. You don't return the phone calls. You don't return the emails. You're rude on the phone. You don't do what you say you're going to do. They're humans with emotions. They're going to hold it against you. And that's the only time I've seen lenders go after someone on a deficiency judgment relentlessly was when that person was just a bad person to that lender. I think that that's such great advice because what most – it's taken me many, many years. Look, if you're in real estate in New York City – you're not a pussy cat, and 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 when you're not a pussy cat, you um, try to throw your weight around, especially with lenders. It's a big mistake. Big mistake. Yeah. Lenders, smart borrowers, <sighs> need to go in, and there's a few rules, okay, and so few guys understand it. One, always return the phone call. Yes. You know, you may be dying inside, but smile, and 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 be as nice as you can. Never make a promise you can't keep. And when you make a promise and you keep it, shove it in their face over and over so they keep trusting you. Right. And, and, but the key is don't look at the lender as your adversary because you will make them an adversary and they have all the cards. If you, the idea is to make them your partner. But it, you see, most of them come in already too late, right? And when they're already too late, the lender has already started to whip them, and so they don't have anything to do but whip back. That's I when they. But just want to put that. But it, uh, that's when they start. That's when they start. That's when borrowers start to commit fraud, to 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 to, to put to pay pay Paul to to, to pay Peter. And I want to tell the borrowers and the tenants and any who anyone who owes anybody money, go to your lawyer first to discuss what your options are. Don't don't also listen to your cousin who's gonna give you that lawyer. Do some research. Go to the bar association. You know, reach out to a consultant, right? Don't go to your friend who knows this guy in like somewhere that you have to do your research. Google, read about it, watch YouTube, listen and, to us. And the other thing is if you have played games, right? 
You've done the stuff you shouldn't have. Don't file for bankruptcy. You will get screwed. So let me switch, not switch the conversation completely. So let me give you my angle on this marketplace and what I see in sort of in the trenches. Historically, we're builder developers, right? And you look at it and you go, you shouldn't be paying for anything on market, merchant development, interest rates through the roof, right? So you went out to capital and you go, what are you looking for? And they're like, rescue capital. Can we insert capital into these new deals? Do they make sense? So let's make the assumption the asset does make sense, right? What it does, does that mean? Sense. What yields do you need to generate for it to make sense? I think that private equity and capital on the sidelines say the same thing. They all have the same marching orders. Total development cost as a cap rate at stabilization, you know, with looking and, and testing all of your variables, 7%. You got to stabilize at a 7 Okay, well, that's your assumptions, but yes. but if they're not but building, no, no, if you're not building metric, into based a, yeah. on that, with leverage is an eighteen to twenty two RRR with a two x return with okay? with an exit in five years, five year exit Sounds with right. a okay. three year stabilization. Three, well, it, depending on where you're yeah, at okay. within it, right? So that's fine. Th- that's so that's what they're all looking for. So you solve for that, right? You solve for that. And what's their problem with capital? They can't mitigate construction and development risk. They have no idea about a half built asset and they need originations. Like you said, find the deals, understand what it takes to complete, and you can do it. Great. Found the capital, found the deal, went to the bank, and the bank's story is today, and it's July, we can do it better. We'll take it over and we'll finish it on half-built assets. So what I come in, I come in and my team comes in, and we have to create leverage for the lender to listen to us. And the borrower doesn't understand, hold on, mm-hmm. the borrower doesn't get the fact. I had a client a day ago, you're a lawyer, you're going to start fighting with them. I was like, Joe, Joe, what do you want me to do? You want me to roll over and die? How do you expect me to get somebody to listen to you? And he's like, well, you just asked them. I was like, yeah, well, if I just had to ask them, you wouldn't need me. So it's our job in order to successfully restructure. When you're restructuring, you're investing into a new venture, a new venture of trying to get your lender to listen to you. And sometimes you have to do it through a fight. In my younger years in practicing, I thought being nice will get you somewhere. Unfortunately, that's not the- that's Which not look, the, we know that, the, look at the right. Middle East, peace at the end of the gun. No, I understand what yeah. we're stating and how you get there. My yeah. just, we were talking about what's happening uh, today. Greg, what's happening? What's happening to me? I'm in the room with the bank, with my private equity next to you. me. And they're playing, we will take it over. Mm. We will finish this asset. And I'm going, I know the concrete guy. I know that you don't how, have how a many, clue what's how happening. Many, how many units? And how many 129 buildings? on one, 38 on another. Same lender. No, the the one the the lender on the buck twenty nine is different from the other okay. one. Okay, so my suggestion to you is the next time you're sitting in a room with a lender that says that to you, is now it's very hard to do in a single building with one hundred twenty nine units. But if you're doing townhouses or something like that, say okay, you know what, you do all of them except two. Let me do two, and then watch me do two and. Find some way to incent them to let you do that. They're not going to do that. Well, it's single loan, though. I'm saying it's 129 mm-hmm. unit multifamily in NYC. Can I tell you why it's not going to work? Struck. You know why it's not going to work? I'll tell you why it's not going to work. Because the borrower, the borrower failed to call back the lender multiple times. Maybe. Has signed, wait, wait, just let me finish. Has signed forbearance agreements, has made promises, has bought his time or her time, and they failed to perform multiple times. Right. So when you're coming into the negotiation, right. you're already, saying, they're not going to want to do business with right. them. I, I, say, I agree with you. They've but, lost faith. I'm the faith. Okay. Wait, hold on. All four of us uh, agree, 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 agree. I have one so first, time, but I have a thought for you, okay? Yes. You're very didactic, and that doesn't work in negotiations, I oh, think, Oh, it does Jacob. for me. It's worked for it me has. for 50 by the years. Way, I, the only one in this room who it's proven it's worked. By the, by the way. <laughs> by the, I'm <laughs> talking about borrower's perspective, Jacob, not opportunist perspective. The opportunist, of course, is going to get on Listen, the phone with I, the lender. Listen, I started without nothing. I, I figured out. But so let, me, let me, me just suggest something, mm-hmm. okay? You're going for the wrong part of the market. You're trying to make your deal with the only guy who can't make a deal with you, the borrower. No, I'm with the lender. You're with the, he's with the lender. You're, uh, so why can't you make a deal? So I'll tell we, you why I'll tell you, you can't why. make the deal. Wait, 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 why no, no, can't you make a deal? I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to yeah. tell you why. You, gonna, you know the answer? 
in in my perspective, I'm talking about the market. And I'll talk about my perspective. Okay. Yeah, but so I first, need to understand the deal. You you no, have no, a I'm going to tell you now. The borrower, they've lost faith. He's like, I'd give you the keys. Yeah. Okay. The private equity is solving for their return, right? Which is, and that's how you have to underwrite the deal. Wait, wait. There, the lend. There is no commercial bank. It's a private lender. Private lender. Ah, okay, that's a different story. So, which is ninety nine percent of what's out there? Because after oh eight, commercial yep. lenders. Stop, stop, stop. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Give me I'll, here. You have a you have one hundred twenty unit building, half built. One hundred twenty unit building, half built. Seventy five million dollar loan. Properties worth sixty two million dollars. You're, you're not making that deal. Uh, right. Seventy five million, sixty two million dollars. It's worth. You're coming to the bank and you're saying, listen, please. I need ten more million dollars. Please put ten more million in and give me a hope note. They, you know what they said? No. No. Right. Not why? Taking a why? 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 They don't have that? faith in you. No, it's not because of that. Yes. It's because the lender is overplaying its hand. Well, that's part of it, but also but they the, won't overplay their hand to a third party the way they will to the borrower. But I, I just correct. want to go back to something. Yes. Mm-hmm. I believe that you can. So, I, I. 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 Yeah. You had to originate. A, well, I, I need to understand something. This 129 unit building, you learned about it from the lender. I created a massive platform. I, I no, I didn't learn it from right. the lender. So, so the borrower's still in control of the asset. The borrower is is like, whatever you guys work out, I'm with you. Uh, right. So now, so now, one of the things that I think. So you started out by saying, I build like 20 unit townhouses, smaller projects. No, the, the my background? Oh. No, 21 story building, 218 uh, units, because whatever. Because those, those, you're never getting now. There, there, is, there is no lender, especially a hard money lender, that is going to give up what they see as the value of the upside. They'll do that once it's finished and they've lost their ass. You need to go after an asset that either is owned by a commercial bank, because they will do that deal with you all day long. I agree. Or by a, a different type of asset. You need an asset that doesn't that the lender understands, if it's not a bank, that the lender understands this is not a, a, a home run if I finish you know, 125,000 square feet of, of building. You need something that's got the townhouses, the three-story. The, 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 something that is got, you got to get your hands really dirty. Well, well, let what, me ask you about that. The business plan that the lender lent on was a condominium building, which gives a certain value, which is what we were developing in New York because you can't make multifamily work at the land sales, the highest and best use. So they borrow on that. So well, now the highest, the, the highest, can't. no, no, but remember this happened already. It's a right. half built building. So today the lender is like condo Basis is X. And you're like, great, you can make a lot of money with condos, but no one's buying there. It was never a condo community. I'm underwriting as a rental. I'm solving for the private equities return, which means you lender, I have to put you behind some of my money in a hope note. And they're like, we'll get our value. Lenders not do that until it has to. Right. Right. And that's the problem with your deal. The lender still has someone to go after. The way you make Once the lender is sitting there on an island by itself and has the asset in its pocket, that's when you so, need to talk to them. And that's why you them. said it's 420 guys, guys, and not you're veering time. away. You're veering away from the interest of why we're having this oh. discussion. The interest of why we're having this discussion is not to talk about how how an opportunist obtains a piece of property from a borrower. We're talking about- From a lender. From the, from the lender. I'm sorry. For, we're talking about how a borrower- What is the relationship between a borrower and a lender and how do we cross that bridge? I think one of the suggestions you're saying is- Persuade, persuade the lender to think like a third party would. I, I got to tell you guys, until the lender is in control of the asset, those types of deals would shock me if they get done. Okay? Fascinating. There might be one out of a thousand lenders that's sufficiently sophisticated and able to sell it up. The, the lender's problem Unless it's the principal who's seeing the profit. In, see, you the, the deals to the opportunities will always come. See, his opportunities, you your business is frothy right now and will continue to get frothy until his business gets frothy. And what when does his that mean, business frothy? what do you mean for strong? Uh, well, you it's, know, it's, it's well. bubbly up, it's yeah, it's, bubbly it's up. very exciting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, uh, your business is going to struggle right now and become frothy when the lenders have control of the assets. You, 
the, your business is really should focus. If I were you, I'd be making friends with every REO manager at every commercial bank and forget the hard money guys. They believe that they are smarter than everyone. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I used to do hard money lending, right? When I had liquidity and I didn't want to buy real estate. We all think, we, I, hard money guys are loan to own guys. Yeah, the hard money guys want to partner with me because I'm the, when they take it, yes. their in-house credibility to develop, yes. which I'm not. I, I'm a third party and I will develop it with them. And so hard money talks to me every day about, should I take this back? What's a, what are we developing yes, this for? Or buying it from, buying the paper from them. But, but then you got to struggle with the borrowers. Yeah. Yeah. You will have so much opportunity of REO. Your business should be focused solely on REO. Mm -hmm. and, and, and until there's enough of it there, you should become friendly with the and guys who lend in those communities. In December, now, October, when is that? Uh, you'll start seeing the REO, you know, in, from September to December, you'll start seeing a lot of it. And where do the attorneys how, fit in? Where do many, the attorneys fit in into, into this, into this so, frothiness, so, if you will? So, you're talking about from the lawyer's business of course, perspective? Of course. So I think right now, I think the smartest thing lawyers can do is if I were trying to build my business of course. as a lawyer, I would be putting on seminars on how to deal with, with lenders. debt if, you've, if you owe money to a bank or to a lender. And, 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 and the key is not how great you're going to save them, of course. but start by telling them what not to do. Absolutely. Teach them about what gets them in trouble long term, of course. and then and then you got to give them different routes, you know, different avenues for you know. It's not one size fits all, but it, it's a fascinating time. By the way, we're not going to see this again for a decade. That we agree on. No, we agree on. Yeah. This is a blip. It is a triple whammy between rent laws changing, COVID, and interest rates doubling. This is the, I have been writing great that this storm. is going to happen for the last three years. If you go look at some of my Huffington Post articles, I have been predicting that – and I was three years too early. And I've been making all my decisions. I got out of retail because it's, I'm, I, I don't own single rental or re residential property other than the house I live in and I'm trying to sell that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, I own industrial. I own you know uh, other kind of stuff. But it's, it's, it's a tough – it's going to be great. But the deals are going to be after the lenders get them the, sure. the assets. There are two things that I think are important that you'd mentioned earlier. The first is that from what I've seen to date, at least, the lenders would rather do business with a third party for a worse economic deal than the current borrower for a better deal because they feel they've been burned, they've been abused by all of the phone calls and emails that have been unreturned. They feel that they've been wronged by a borrower. That's the personality but, show. But, but that, borrower, that happens on, at on. the lower level. The Upstairs, borrower, it's a policy. The borrower, depending upon how they've reacted to all of this inbound, you know, the lender's request to make this happen, that borrower controls their own fate in that if they are not returning the phone calls and emails and they have an attitude and they think they're going to steamroll this lender and no, you know, drive no, them no, no. to their knees – that borrower does not do well. They are not driving the car, as, as Jacob said earlier. So. Except for the one or two who really know how to do it and where the borrower, the lender doesn't have the right assignment papers. Or, but, but that's going to be we, super we, technical we have, stuff. We have, right. we have, we have. I'm speaking have from right experience right now. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm speaking, speaking from, from experience. experience. I can tell you that the one thing the lenders know about me is that I'm a great friend and I'm a shitty adversary. <laughs> 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 I have a $40 million loan right now with our office. Uh, they fail to do the assignment uh, Docs properly, and there's a there's they there, may there, lose there, a loan. there's a judge in Manhattan that's going to be uh, giving us a good win of forty right. million dollars in equity. By the way, for any also for anybody else who's listening, you know if 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 you do if you do want to fight the lenders, make sure you have a very very significant bankroll. But if you don't have a significant bankroll, find somebody who does and give them a little bit of your equity so they can finance you. There's always someone that is willing to finance somebody else's shit, somebody else's down on their luck, somebody else's mistakes. So, you know, you got to find the right people to make sure that you can uh, kind of get a second second wind uh, at, 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 at your real estate development career. But outside of the personality aspect that we've all touched on, and it's better to behave as a borrower and, you know, cap uh, capitulate when the time always. is right. Be a gentleman. But always. It's also about the dollars and cents. So in a lot of projects that we're involved in now, we were hired to sell 291 Livingston, which is a stalled construction site as a hotel. Um, the one 343 West 47th Street, 
1325 Atlantic. These are all projects that are anywhere between 50% finished and 80% finished. And the lender did not want to put more money in. They may have had a good relationship with the borrower. I don't know. But it didn't make economic sense past a certain point. They're already in and they don't want to keep chasing good money after bad. They said, we're pulling the ripcord. So either we're getting this back, we're going to sell it to a third party, and we're going to lick our wounds. We don't want to keep funding this and trying to get something finished that's still a loser financially. So you've got both in there. The other place to make money in this kind of an environment is through the special servicers. Because they get a unique right. I have a question. Do you think loan modification special services are going to go on the rise? No. No. No, because there's no reason for them to do – they're only going to do a loan modification if they have a deal they want to or do. Or if the legislation comes out, I think oh, – can no. we talk about legislation for just a second? I don't know enough about what's going on with prospective legislation. I don't, I don't think – I think legislation is not going to come out. That's my take on things because although although New York City might come out with some legislation as they did with guarantors on commercial – uh, commercial uh, leaseholds. But it's only going to be deferrals. It's never no, going to be. No, the, the, the new guarantee law, which my firm uh, was the first one to successfully interpret, uh, and went through the Court of Appeals, search for I was denied. It was about a $15 million um, landlord trying to go after a guarantor. It was ultimately uh, it was ultimately a win for the guarantor because the new guarantee law came out, which basically says if you default between March of 2020 to July 2021, you're not liable on your personal guarantee. I think if the legislator acts that there could be a softer landing for the borrowers and for the lenders, especially if the the federal government comes out and says, you know, I, I think we're, we're I think we're I think we're creating a monster if we're leaving all of the guarantors uh, to their own devices. And I agree with what you said, the Jacob. The conservative Supreme Court, I don't see how that's ever going to happen. But but I hope it happens, but it's not. That, but that's not the way to solve the problem. Th- this problem is going to be solved. There's no doubt this with problem is going to be with solved. Your take, you're telling me that, that all the lawyers are going to be just, just basically running interference and with some light. No, if their lawyers are doing the right thing, they're actually getting the deals done. The they're only way you can get a just, deal done. You see, yes, there's, there's all, look, I, you know, I'm a lawyer. You know that I love to be strategic about these things and to put obstacles in front of adversaries is smart, but not always. And so the question is, if you've got a gun to your head, you have to throw an obstacle there. The problem is the more obstacles you throw out, the, the more legal less fees willingness <laughs> they're going to, to have to work a deal. The best thing a lawyer can do for a client is figure out up front how to get them out with the, the least amount of with pain. the least amount of pain on their personal life and the least amount of pain in litigation. I have some news for you about that. I have some news for you about that. Sometimes an attorney and the team of that attorney needs needs to fight for that adversary to listen. You have no idea. Yes. How, let me say 100%. it. You have no idea how many times I get on the phone and I say, Joe, how you doing? I'm doing well. What's up? Let my people go. Mm-hmm. Let and, my people go. And you don't smite them with 10 plagues? Hold on. Let my people go. And he says, back in 2018 with the new guarantee law and with another lender that, that had a, I had a field day with with my team, he's like, tell your client that my client told him that we're going to eat his children. I was like, that's what you want me to tell him? He's like, yeah. All right, scored shirts it is. Two, three years later, he calls me back, okay? And he's like, I should have let your people go. I was like, yeah, you should have let my people go. So sometimes, Jacob, there if you're good at what you do as a developer, as a broker, I agree, but you, you have to fight to make them listen. Yeah, but but again, if you get them in early enough. You're doing them a big favor. And the borrowers never come in early. Way, you know what they do? They tee the bar. What the borrowers do, they keep getting the phone calls from the lenders, the softballs, like, hey, hey, Joe, what are you doing today? You know, come into my office. Let's talk about the project. It's been like two, three months. You, you're about to default. Like, yeah. I see what's going on. What do they do? They go to Miami. They go to Miami with their family because they don't want to talk about it. Another month goes by. And then they have counsel and counsel calls. And they call their cousin who's an attorney and, you know, 
Brandon over there does like real estate closings, and he's like, "Hey, what, 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 what's going on?" And the lender's like, "Well, you gotta, you gotta show me something." And he doesn't know what's going on, so he runs the retainer. He's like, oh, "I can't do anything." Another month goes by, and now the lender's pissed. They're like, "Yo, default yeah, you're talking, you. We're talking strategy, and yeah. then we're oscillating back to tactics. Oh. So there's nothing wrong if that tactic gets to this overall strategy, yeah. which is you know trying Early, to work I'm talking it out. Early, right? the more sophisticated the borrowers, the more they're dealing with the banks and ego, a lot of own. ego, a lot of yeah. ego, a lot but of listen, ego. Times, times where the borrower does deal with the bank or they think they're going to deal with the bank or the special servicer, they are bringing a knife to a gunfight, which is what you mentioned before, gun to your head. So the borrower thinks they're coming in, they've got the cards, they're going to do this, they're going to file the 11, they have all these plans in their head. However, they need to realize that the lender or the servicer, they're the ones who are really driving that car because right. they've got, hold on, they've got the war chest. So as we're talking about, you can be a borrower, you can be a wealthy borrower, but you cannot keep affording legal fees no. just as these banks or these special servicers have X hundred million set aside for legal fees. And now you've got guys right. or companies like a key bank that's got personality on retainer, they get a very discounted rate. These lawyers work and work and work for them and they are relentless. I tell my borrowers, you know what I tell my borrowers? They're like, well, how much is it gonna cost me? I was like, okay, how much default interest are you paying? 24%? Okay. Add two zeros to that 24, like 2400%? I was like, yeah, monthly. That's what legal fees cost you. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's hope that we all figure out ways to make money in these times. Or not. Well, thank you, guys. The other, I just want to say Appreciate one last it. thing. Sure. You know, if you do have a borrower that's going to end up in a bad situation, <laughs> yeah, we do have a few. Not only do they have to worry about the um, forgiveness of debt liability. I think that will be legislated. I think that will be legislated. I, I will be. I would take that bet any day of the week with you. I, the second thing is, what kind of, what's the cap rate on your hundred dollars if you win? <laughs> <laughs> he buys me another house that looks like my current house. So, so he, the, he has a condo in Miami. Right? Yeah, that's what they're going to do. So, <laughs> so the borrower should also know, and this is for commercial and residential properties, that a deficiency only comes if the price that the foreclosed assets sold for, or big or the value of the property exceeded the debt. The price that it sells for will never exceed the debt. Right, because, correct. Because foreclosure is set up to fuck the seller and the borrower and to get rid of the uh, equity of redemption. And, and so it's always a low ball. And so what you should always be telling your borrowers who are in trouble, if there's going to be a foreclosure sale, get a friendly appraisal or an unfriendly appraisal, but a real appraisal of the asset at or about just before the time of that sale, because it's the difference between being liable for a deficiency and not. Because if Correct. you had a $20 million mortgage and it went up to the hammer for $100,000, and you walk in with a legitimate appraisal for 21 million, you will have zero deficiency judgment. Right. Makes sense. Not on the UCC though. The UCCs, by the way, you keep talking. About, so firstly, it isn't the property, because the UCC, yes. Is the, it's, is the business. It's, it's, the, the, business it's the, the LLC the that owns it. Interest in and, and by the way, anybody who gives a lender a UCC on their equity as part of a commercial real estate loan deserves to get fucked. I don't unless, agree with that. Unless you can't get the debt I'm going to address that. Hold on. I'm going to address that because I've seen. I give a PG before I gave him that. The only way you can really lose your asset without fighting is through a UCC Can I say sale. something? All the transactional attorneys that are sitting and hearing this and, to, and, and mm -hmm. speaking, I got a message for them, okay? You make the litigation attorneys work so much more harder just because you've been working in as a lawyer in opportunity for your clients, meaning in creating- No shit though. My, 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 just know? let me finish. The, creating that financial transaction. Please, please consult, especially in this atmosphere, consult with a litigation counsel 
on those terms. The deed and lose, the equity redemption waivers, the fact that you can get uh, a di independent director to file for bankruptcy, and you know all of those terms are hurting the borrower. And you can't, you cannot, you cannot put something in front of the borrower to sign if you do not know the motherfucking law on that just because you saw yeah, it but a you thousand times. money. Hold on. They're not going to give you the money. No, no, that's incorrect. That's this incorrect. This typically incorrect. happens after they've already made the loan I when you're in default. Hold what on. What they do hold on. is they strip you of all your rights in order yeah. to forbear. But, 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 and anyone who signs that shouldn't. Stop. Notice provisions, options, more interest. There, I wiggle room. They're the wiggle dance. No, I call it, it the wiggle dance. It's building. It's taking a, a, a spider and building a web you know around them the and, and 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 making them dead. And, you know. You know what happens to the bars? Let me uh, wait. Before it, the, the, you get a pre-negotiation letter, the lender calls you and says, "Hey, you want more yeah, money?" Do you know how many pre-negotiation letters I've signed? Zero. Right. No, no. But that's not, that's you. And you know what I say that's to them? Not the economy. Them, I'm that's more than happy. To, yeah, I understand. That's not the economy. We're talking yes. about those people. We're not talking about you, the smartest yes. man in the world. Like, I am hey, not far from. Thank you. But the the bottom line is the message for the transactional counsel, the commercial. Real estate from from all the the, the, the scattering in the world gosh what they do the big firms the yep. mid-sized firms yep. or the guy in brooklyn that's been doing this for the uncles and the aunts for so many years that doesn't negotiate well before these borrowers enter into these transactions and for the borrowers make sure you have a, a departure strip that is long enough for you to start way before way before when you have to sign something to get that financing. So time needs to be on your side. You need to have a good commercial counsel. Fine. You trust them. Call your litigation counsel. Let them look at the deed and loop provisions, foreclosure provisions, the stripping of the rights. Let them put in notice provisions, options of some sort, more reserve interest, uh, duty to duty uh, to negotiate in good faith terms. Those terms are never there. And I always read those documents, and I'm like, why couldn't they give, just give them more notice, more time? And the lender, they would agree, especially if they don't yet know the borrower. If they don't know the borrower, they don't know to be aggressive with them, they'll be lenient. So you hit, you hit on something very important with that is time. So we've been going under a faulty premise in a lot of these conversations that we're talking about a sophisticated borrower that knows what a UCC is, knows what an Article 9 is, knows to avoid these. A lot of these people are not. They're going in, they're either first-time first uh, first borrowers or they don't know what to look for. And because they didn't have time to hire an attorney to review these loan docs a week or two in advance, they get into a room, they know they're losing the asset tomorrow. The lender says, I'm going to lend you the $20 million you need to get out of this situation. They say, that sounds great. They, they get in the room, they say, here are two loans to sign. One for 19, one for one. They say, "What? why do I need two? They say, eh, shut up and sign it. You want to lose your property tomorrow? Go ahead and sign it. They and the transactional counsel like, yeah, yeah, sign. Right. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And they don't realize that they've just signed one for the senior, secured by the property, and one for the meds, secured by the membership interest. Right. So they don't realize. They got their $20 million, They saved their property for another day. Oh, they feel like they got a win. But when that comes right. back... Alive, that's when they're in trouble. The different, Sorry. as a borrower, the more you are becoming successful in your transaction amount, going from 1 million to 5 million to 10 million to 50 million, you need to change your counsel. Well, okay. you do, and you become more. Listen, you when I was borrowing, when I was borrowing, when I was borrowing a million dollars, I signed whatever the bank stuck in front of me. Yep. When I was borrowing a right. hundred million dollars, it took a month to negotiate the loan documents, Correct. and we just don't say yes till we're ready. And that's the difference. I can assure you, related gets lots of concessions. Of course, and and when you're dealing with a little guy or gal whose who whose tongues are hanging out because they. And listen, we've all been in those situations, right? They're horrible, but but when you're sophisticated and you've made enough mistakes to learn from, and you take a breath and take your time, then thing you can negotiate. And the other thing you should also tell your clients is, it's never as bad as it seems, and yeah, it's never as true, good true. as it seems. That's true. And if you can get a little bit of indifference into your life, you'll be a lot happier. Huh. 
Well, listen, coming from experience of making every move that you guys said on UCC and the rest of it, you know, from what we stated in the beginning, you have to learn from your mistakes to move forward. So Gotham I totally hear you. I think Gotham deserves a uh, better class of counsel, broker, and investor in 2023, 2024. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks. guys.